Hi, everyone, and welcome to Memories of Historic Woodland Park. My name is Kimberly McKee. I'm the director of the Coochie Office of Local History. And the Coochie Office is located in the Brooks College of Interdisciplinary Studies at Grand Valley State University. Our mission is to give voice to diverse communities through history. And so today's presentation, again, is Memories of Historic Woodland Park. I'm really excited that author Diana Cross Torren is able to join us today. A native of Lansing, Diana has been visiting this lake since she and her three younger siblings were children. The cottage, as her family affectionately calls it, was established in 1947. Her father told stories of his youth from the area, and she wanted to get all these stories into her book that she'll be speaking about today. She took his collection of memories and interviewed many more residents and vacationers from Woodland Park. She has two grown children and now resides in Cincinnati, Ohio, but whenever she can, she visits her second home on the beautiful lake of Woodland Park. Please note that if you do have any questions, please comment in, within the Q&A or chat if you have additional questions. And please note that we will not be able to get to all of the audience questions. Our webinar is being recorded and will be available online by tomorrow. So if you couldn't make it or can't stay for the entire thing or know of somebody who couldn't make it, please let them know. We're really excited um, about today's talk. So without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Diana. Thank you, Kim. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for your interest in hearing about my favorite subject and place to be Woodland Park, Michigan. Um, I'm going to go into some history, but bear with me because it is all relevant. Our cottage in Woodland Park has been in my family since my father was 17 and he is 91 years young now. Um, what you see behind me is the beautiful view from our cottage. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. And after returning from our annual um, week at the cottage in 2013, I became interested in Woodland Park's history only to find that there was very little written about it. It sparked my interest. My father told me stories about our cottage during his youth and through the years. I thought someone should write this down for our family. As I started formulating a story, it made me curious about the history that I couldn't find. After numerous dead ends, I was able to connect to a, uh, with a man who was also writing a book about Woodland Park and probably the person with the most uh, history and information and photographs. His name was Stephen Jones and he was the nephew of Malcolm X. He was writing a book about Woodland Park and he told me a lot of information about the people that my father remembered from his childhood and a lot of history about Woodland Park. Tragically, he died a year later, not completing his book. And so I was back on my own to find out the mystery of Woodland Park's origins. To tell Woodland Park's history includes looking back years before. When the slaves had been freed, there had been no provisions made. There was no money given so that they could make any kind of integration into the white health system. The shack they lived in, they didn't own, nor did they um, have any ownership for the land or had any money. Kind of a version of today's homeless, except that they couldn't even beg for help. There wasn't anybody willing to help them. Unlike the immigrants from Ireland and Germany, with European features, they were easily identifiable because of the color of their skin. They became easy pickings to be economically held into slavery from their former masters through sharecropping. Along with this, they were being lynched for small or no transgressions and had no support from the law. In 1896 came a Supreme Court ruling that held up segregation. That was called Plessy versus Ferguson or what would be known as Jim Crow law. This law created a separation between the races in just about every aspect. 
most restaurants, hotels, schools, hospitals, and gas stations did not allow people of color as customers, even though their money was the same color. Any colored only section was substandard. This was considered separate but equal, but wasn't equal at all. Tired of living this type of life, being afraid of getting lynched and the call for um, of automation and better opportunities in the North, many black Southerners fled the South. The chart shows um, an example of the impact of blacks during four decades in Detroit, Michigan, just Detroit alone. Um, this black movement away from the South was the largest migration in US history. In Detroit, for example, Ford hired a lot of black workers. Suddenly people of color had their own homes and something that they didn't have before, disposable income. They could now vacation if it weren't for Jim Crow laws. They could only make the trips back down South that they fled to stay with their relatives who hadn't left. The journey alone could put them in harm's way or in embarrassing situations. Michigan was not only booming in the automotive industry, but they also had a big boom in the lumber industry. Chicago had to be rebuilt after the great fire and Fremont, Michigan also had a massive fire. This industry made rich people, more rich people than the gold rush out west. One lumber mill was run on a beautiful lake called Crooked Lake. There were mostly indigenous people living in the area. The 1850 census in the picture shows how some of them were recorded. The mill was called Brookings Mill and they renamed the, Brookin, renamed the lake Brookings Lake. They were there for many years because it took a lot of time to cut down all those white pine. Over time, Brookings Mill built a small village that included a post office, store, a one-room schoolhouse, along with a wooden footbridge and a large bunkhouse. By the end of the 1890s, Brookings had stripped the forest on their property of all the white pines, so they moved on. The Brookings land went back to the county for black, back taxes. A few people tried to farm on the land, but for the most part, it stood vacant for a few decades. There was a group of investors who had been opening white resorts all over the state of Michigan. One of them was Walter Anderson, who came up with the idea of opening up a black resort. This was really unique thinking and probably very unpopular, but they saw an untapped market. They found a track of land with a lake near Baldwin. It was centrally located between most of the cities where they had the largest black populations. In 1915, they started the first black resort in Michigan and named it Idlewild. Many say it was because the men were idle and the women were wild. It was a huge success. Among the group of white investors were two brothers, Erastus and Adelbert Branch from White Cloud, Michigan, and Wilbur Lemon and Alvin Wright, who are from Chicago. The Branch brothers are shown in the picture. Adelbert in the back far right and Erastus in the front far left. Erastus was very involved in Idlewild. He and his wife would meet with the new property owners and would cheerfully welcome them to their new place. What is odd about this is the Branch brothers were members of the Ku Klux Klan. What's interesting is, and what I found out and I didn't know, is that the Northern KKK at the time did not share the same uh, hatred for Blacks as their white counterparts down South. They were more against the um, religions that were not Protestant. Wilbur Lemon and Alvin Wright will be brought up again later. This group of investors was very wise in how they marketed Idlewild. They knew that most Blacks didn't trust the white people, so they hired Black salesmen to sell their lots. Idlewild would be owned by white investors until 1921, 
then it was fully owned by the Blacks. Idlewild would eventually be more known for the Black entertainer and entertainment that was performed in their nightclubs. Even though Idlewild was an all Black resort, some of the nights around 50% of their patrons were white. They loved to come and hear that soulful kind of music and see great entertainment. There was an influx of Irish and German immigrants, many who were Catholic coming into America. With them came their drinking culture. This clashed with the Protestant way of living. There was a large push to prohibit alcohol by the women's temperance group, the KKK and the Andy Saloon League. In Van Buren County, Michigan, they really pushed hard for it. So hard that in 1918, two years before the rest of the United States, they started prohibition. There was a couple living in Van Buren at the time, Nate Frank and Sadie Coombs. They had no children and were in their late 60s. They, be, they bought a piece of land within the boundaries of where the old Brookings Mill settlement once was. It was on a peninsula with a lake on two sides separated by a narrow channel. And that wooden bridge that I talked about before was adjacent to their property. They had the run of the lake and the forest and they built a house, some small cabins and started the Oak Leaf Resort. In the cabin nearest the wooden bridge but the farthest from the rest of the property, they built a secret basement that they could access from a, la a hatch in the floor. With this seclusion, Frank was able to run his resort. When prohibition began for all the America, for the rest of America in 1920, Frank used his pro uh, property for a more lucrative business, beer and whiskey. He hid his liquor in the secret basement. The soil in the area was perfect to grow the hops needed for the beer. He would entertain mobsters and sell his liquor to people like Al Capone and Dutch Anderson. Dutch would later be shot to death by a policeman in Muskegon who would also die in that same confrontation. Dutch had been to the Oak Leaf just a few days before he got shot. One of Idlewild's black salesmen was a man named Marion Arthur. Marion had been born in 1875 in Kenton, Ohio. One of the census said he only had an eighth grade education. He moved to California and was a potter. He moved back to Ohio and was an assistant librarian at the Toledo Public Library, the only black person working there. He was a porter for the railroad, a special messenger to federal judge John Milton Killets in 1912 before becoming an Idlewild uh, salesman. And they called that the IRC, Idlewild Resort Company. His wife, Ella, was born in Ontario, Canada. Both sets of her grandparents were escaped slaves. Her paternal grandparents, were able to make a good living in Canada. In fact, they were considered wealthy by white standards. Canada's race laws were very relaxed. The only issue that they still held on to was segregated schools. That was unacceptable to Ella's grandfather. So he gave his son a large uh, amount of money and sent him and his family to live in Monroe, Michigan. Why Monroe, Michigan? It isn't known. The Fosters were one of the wealthiest families in Monroe and were treated like they were white. Ella knew what white standards were. She and her siblings went to white schools. Their family were high up in the white church, had businesses in, in the best sections of town, and had, if not the finest house, the second finest house in Monroe. Ella's sister Myrtle would eventually become involved in women's rights and civil rights movement. She would work with many of the black leaders at the time. Two in particular were W.E.B. Du Bois and Hallie Q. Brown. We will come back to both later. 
Marion and Ella married in 1902 and they never had any children. After Marion being a salesman for the IRC, he saw what kind of opportunity they could have if they started their own resort. With the help of their friends from Chicago, white investors, Alvin Wright and Wilbur Lemon, they purchased the Brookings Mill property and renamed it Woodland Park. Obviously, Frank wasn't too happy about his new neighbors and his property was enclosed within the boundaries of what they purchased. Not only did he not have full run of the lake anymore in the woods, but his new neighbors were black. As the building of the new resort began, Frank nailed up racist signs all over his pro property and many used the N-word and forbidden anybody of color to walk on his wooden bridge. It was possible that Frank really wasn't a racist because of what happens later. What I believe Frank was doing by hanging those terrible signs was keeping people out of his illegal business and his mobster clients hidden from the law. For a year or so, one of the residents must have gotten tired of seeing those signs that were closest to the road because one day he stopped and pulled a clawfoot hammer out of his car and tore down the sign. Frank seeing him do it came down to confront him but must have changed his mind after the angry black man yelled at him and told him never put up another sign like that again. And Frank never did. Also, the locals in Woodland Park didn't call the property the Oak Leaf. It was always referred to as Coombs Hill. The picture shown of W.E.B. Du Bois and Marion was taken in Woodland Park. The top right photo also taken in Woodland Park shows Ella with the stick and Marion in the cap. The photo below shows Ella in her high school class of 1893. And she, whoops, I'm sorry. I'm gonna go back. I think you can figure out who she is in the picture. <laughs> the map on the left shows where Idlewild and Woodland Park are located. Idlewild in the blue and Woodland Park in the red. They're about 18 miles apart. Because Woodland Park didn't have its own post office, it shared one of the uh, one in the white community of Bightley that bordered the north side of Woodland Park. The Bightley reference was used interactively as part of Woodland Park, although they are in reality separate communities. The other map shows how they're centrally accessible from the black populations in Chicago, Detroit, Toledo, Cleveland, Pontiac, etc. In the Green Book, a book that was published to guide black travelers to safe places to stop during segregation, there are two entries for Bightley that were really Woodland Park, the Royal Breeze and the Cal Calsonia. Why they didn't list more of their businesses and hotels, we can only speculate. Maybe they felt they didn't need to because during the summer, Woodland Park was always full. In 1922, Frank sold a section of his property located in the middle of Coombs Hill. It was sold to the Bies family. The first few years they would come up, they put up tents. For Sadie, it had to be a wonder, it had to be wonderful because she was so isolated and probably Frank didn't allow her to have friends in Woodland Park. The photo on the far right shows them making beer and also if you look closely, you can see the hops that were growing on the trellises. Frank probably taught them how to make that beer. When the Arthurs first bought Brookins property, there was about six buildings still standing. And that included a one room schoolhouse, the wooden bridge and the boarding house and another outbuilding that you can see over to the right. One of the first buildings that they built, um, that they rehabbed, 
was a hotel and they aptly named it Woodland Park Hotel. The sign in the picture states that it has information on lots, lodging, boats, meals, cottages, groceries, meats, and ice cream. Although it was nice, it wasn't long before they knew it wasn't large enough or classy enough to bring the type of vacationers they were targeting. They wanted the upper class blacks to vacation in Woodland Park. No, this was this first hotel wouldn't do. So again, Ella knew what it was like to have the best. Although it was separate, it would be better than equal. They sold the Woodland Park Hotel to a man named Just Parker. He renamed it the Pine Cone Tavern. And that's the picture on the far right. Fortunately, Ella preserved the history of Woodland Park by taking photographs of the new cottages, hotels, and anything she thought reflect what Woodland Park was. She turned those photos into postcards. These postcards um, saved Woodland Park's visual history. The authors decided where the boarding house was, they would tear it down and build their beautiful new hotel. The picture shows them in front of the old boarding house. When they started to tear away the outer boards, they found that underneath was a well-built structure that was still in great shape. Instead of tearing it down, they added on. They named their beautiful hotel, the Royal Breeze. Many upper-class blacks stayed in the Royal Breeze. One of their guests was a man named Anthony Overton, who would be considered the Black Rockefeller or Bill Gates of that time. Other guests were Black civil rights leaders who were friends and acquaintances of Ella's sister, Myrtle. The Royal Breeze had 56 rooms, brand new furnishings, included three family rooms with three beds two huge stone fireplaces, full kitchen, large dining room and a, that had white tablecloths, screened in veranda with flowers, well-kept grounds, boats for rent, vehicles to shuttle the guests back and forth to Idlewild, serving and cleaning staff in three rental cottages. In Woodland Park, there was also plots that were larger for anyone who wanted to farm called Woodland Park Acres. The Arthurs also had a farm. On their farm, they had a herd of cows, flocks of chickens, and large vegetable garden. They supplied the Royal Breeze with fresh meat and vegetables. Harry Spooner, a white columnist um, for a white cloud paper, wrote an article about Woodland Park. It was pretty lengthy. In it, he said, the type of people who bought property in this resort are the best. They have to be intelligent and thrifty in order to purchase lots here. The establishment of this project of colored people, for colored people and by colored people is unique and its presence in the county will undoubtedly do much to remove the prejudice that has existed among their white brothers. Near the one room schoolhouse sat an old shack. It wasn't very big, maybe two rooms, no utilities or plumbing and most likely a dirt floor. It was owned by a white family from Indiana. They would allow their friends, the Browns, another white family from Indiana to come and fish. The Browns would often hear the owners tell their friends about their property in Brookings not their shack in Brookings. <laughs> they would let the Browns use the shack anytime they wanted to. The Browns liked the people of Woodland Park and they considered some of them as friends. Ironically, they did not like Frank Coombs and avoided him. They would barter for water, cake and other things with the fish they caught. They were some of the best fishermen in Woodland Park. Pete Brown loved Woodland Park so much that he wrote a pamphlet of one page stories about some of the people or experiences that he had in Woodland Park. And he called it Fish Tales, Tales spelled T-A-L-E-S. 
The story to the right is one of his. The middle photo is Pete's father, Mike, standing in front of the shack. Going back to separate but equal, a funny thing. Here was, a, here was white people staying in a shack with no running water and no electricity and just walking distance away, there were black people staying in one of the most luxurious hotels in the area. The first corner store in Woodland Park was an old trolley car that had been cleverly converted. It was run by a widowed black lady named Maddie Keller. She would later build a better store, a few hotels and rental cottages. On that same corner, there would be a store for many years. When the last store burned down, the property eventually became the children's playground that it is today. As I said earlier, Ella's sister Myrtle had influential friends and acquaintances because of the work she did in civil rights and the women's movement. One of the associations was with Hallie Q. Brown Hallie lived in Canada, the same place where Ella was born, but moved to Wilberforce, Ohio in her youth. She also lived a more upper class black life like Ella. She attended, graduated and taught at Wilberforce and eventually became a Dean there. Her refined education led her to become a well-known elocutionist who gave beautiful speeches. She traveled to Europe where she gave some of those very speeches in the presence of royalty, one of who was Queen Victoria. Her second trip to Europe was funded entirely by W.E.B. Du Bois. She built her simple one room cottage with a fireplace in Woodland Park in 1923. She loved coming to Woodland Park where she could rough it. And even though she lived a very pampered lifestyle, she still loved coming to Woodland Park. One of the people I interviewed had her as a Sunday school teacher at Wilberforce. She said Hallie gave her some jewelry and that Hallie confided that she didn't like to wear undergarments. Hallie lived to be 102. The library at Central States in Wilmington is named after her. The historical marker shown is in front of the library. There were other very well run establishments in Woodland Park. The food was said to be outstanding at all these places. People from bordering white communities would come and have meals in these hotels. Old Boys Rest had been at one time burned down. The owner was known to wring his hands and say, oh dear, all the time. And so he was given that nickname, oh dears and the rebuilt hotel was renamed Odeer's Rest as shown in the bottom left photo. The other two photos are of the Calsonia um, and the Calsonia is in the green book. The interior picture shows a rack of postcards that were most likely Ella's pictures that she had made into postcards. Woodland Park and the surrounding white communities coexisted in harmony. The blacks were welcome to shop in the white stores for the items not found in the Woodland Park store. The bottom left photo is of Fred Griffin, Griffith from Bightley. In the winter, he would come over to Woodland Lake and cut up ice that would be used for the ice boxes of Woodland Park's hotels and by the residents. This was before refrigeration. He made the ice cutting machine from an old Model T Ford. The photo above of the white lady fishing is Mrs. Henderson. She was from Norway and had married a black man named John. They came to Woodland Park to live without fear or repercussions and maybe even death. Woodland Park had other such mixed marriages. It was illegal back then in some states to have mixed marriages but these couples were embraced um, by Woodland Park. The Hendersons had only lived in Woodland Park a short time before John died. Mrs. Henderson, and I'm not sure if her name was Daisy or Viola,
because there's two names in the um, records, stayed the remainder of her years. She may have been a nurse previously because she delivered a lot of the Woodland Park babies as a midwife and healed many with her natural remedies that she harvested from the woods and vegetation. She made money by being the cleaning lady, getting the, the summer vacationers cottages ready for the new season or after they left from their stay. This is another twist where the cleaning lady was white and worked for the black people. The last photo shows the Woodland Park's one of Woodland Park's entrepreneurs, J.B. Steele. He started the J.B. Steele uh, Social Club and guided his clients of all races in fishing and hunting. There were never any race related issues outside of Frank Coombs racist signs. Eventually the Arthurs decided the Royal Breeze, no matter how grand was too small to be both the hotel and to hold all the social events that they hosted. They had mapped out a piece of land on a prominent point that was never subdivided. They built one of the finest clubhouse, clubhouses around. Harry Spooner, the white writer from White Cloud wrote, directly across the lake from the hotel is the clubhouse. It is located on a promontory on a point which affords the view of the lake with its many bays and wooded shores. It is 66 by 82 feet in size and contains a lobby large enough to accommodate 100 couples for dancing without crowding. Three sides of it are surrounded by a veranda 16 feet wide, all screened in and hung with flowers and ferns. There is a large open cobblestone fireplace in the lobby and a large dining room, refreshment room and kitchen. The latter is equipped with a large electric refrigerator. The building has its own electric light and water system. Spooner went on to say, a boardwalk is now being in process of being constructed. It leads from a large platform in front of the clubhouse to the end of the point. It will have seats on both sides of the entire length. The point will be laid out in flower gardens among the beautiful nature, natural trees now growing there. The clubhouse cost uh, $10,000 to build. Connecting it are 10 sleeping cottages arranged in a semicircle in the woods nearby. So this was certainly uh, separate, but better. Near the end of the 1920s, the Coombs were elderly and struggling to keep the oak leaf going. Frank became ill and Sadie had a hip problem. Frank decided to hire a black woman from Woodland Park named Grace Henry to help Sadie with the cooking and the cleaning. They also hired a black youth named James Tyson from Woodland Park. He was only around eight or 10. Earlier I said, I didn't know if Frank was racist or just protecting his illegal business. I don't think the Tysons would have sent their young son uh, to work with the Coombs if they thought that he would be in peril or mistreated. It was also said that Sadie loved James. Remember, they didn't have any children of their own. He was welcomed by the buys as shown in the photo. When Frank became bedridden and Sadie was running things, she allowed anyone to use the wooden bridge. When Frank died, Sadie asked if she could hold his funeral in one of the Black Woodland Park churches. There were three. Having no white friends, there were only Blacks in, attending, in attendance. They were curious to see the notorious Frank Coombs. Sadie's health would eventually erode and she ended up selling the oak leaf to a Black couple from Chicago named the Tuckers. They renamed the oak leaf the Shangri-La, and that's what it's called today. Frank paid for his racist signs one final way. 
1930 census has the Coombs listed as black. black. Of course, there was no way that the Coombs would ever know since the census information is only released after 72 years have passed. The one room schoolhouse had been left behind by the Brookings Mill was remodeled by the Arthurs and they made sure that they hired good teachers so the children of Woodland Park had a good education. Across the street from the schoolhouse was a little cement block cottage. It was owned by the Trotters. Their daughter Marva would be the first wife and the second wife of the well-known boxer Joe Lewis. Joe and Marva would come to Woodland Park. They would stay in either the Calsonia or the Royal Breeze. Joe would spend most of his time in Idlewild where his manager's mother owned the bar because he liked that kind of atmosphere. Marva wanting to be near her parents would stay at the stay in Woodland Park. Not many years ago uh, um, in Woodland Park, a lady named Rolanda Richardson bought a beautifully framed religious picture for a couple of dollars at a yard sale. She didn't want the religious picture, she just wanted the frame. As she removed the back off the frame and separated it from the religious picture, this photograph fell out. The photo had been taken inside that trotter's cottage. Someone must have hidden it there and forgot about it. This is one of Woodland Park's businesses and was run from a repurposed bus. Nell made individual pies, barbecue, fried chicken, to name a few of her menu items, and served it on that bus. Um, sadly, in 1941, after an operation, Ella died. Marion's partner and mentor to a better way for people of color was gone. Their remaining plans for Woodland Park were never realized. Marion had a stroke and joined Ella in 1944. Some of the plans that they had included um, a, a railroad stop that would stop in Woodland Park, a convention center, and some sustaining industry that would give the residents uh, uh, jobs. In 1941, Hallie Q. Brown sold her cottage for a dollar to a prominent Bishop Ransom who had been her friend and student at Wilberforce. Bishop Ransom shown in the top left photograph. He was, a well respect, he was well respected by both black and white. W.E.B. Du Bois credited Bishop Ransom with forming the foundations of the NAACP. Bishop Ransom, who was living in Wilberforce, Ohio, was asked by Ohio Governor Davey to be on the board of pardon and uh, parole. Up until then, there had been no blacks, although the majority of the prisoners were black. That same summer that Halley gave him the cottage, he was vacationing there when he received a telegram from the White House requesting him to come be a member of the voluntary participate Participate, sorry, participation committee and had to come to the White House to meet with President Roosevelt. It included a luncheon with Eleanor. He had also received a letter at his home personally written from President Roosevelt, but because he was at the cottage, he hadn't seen it. Bishop Ransom was friend to Presidents McKinley, FDR, and Harry Truman. When Bishop Ransom became too old to make the long trip, he followed in Halley's footsteps. He gave the cottage to someone who he and Halley held in high regards. It was another student of Wilberforce named Joseph Gomez, who was shown in the group photograph behind the lady next to President Kennedy. He would become the Bishop of the fourth district in the AME Church. Bishop Gomez worked with both the Kennedys, Vice President Hubert Humphrey, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Medgar Evers, Chicago, Chicago's 
Mayor Daly, Mayor Carl Stro Stokes, and Jesse Jackson, to name a few. I stumbled through those names, sorry. Most of who visited that little cottage in Woodland Park. In the last picture is Reverend A.A. A. Banks. Reverend Banks was one of the most loved and respected ministers of the Second Baptist Church in Detroit, the largest black church in Michigan. This church was started by 12 ex-slaves and was part of the Underground Railroad. He had a cottage on the point where the clubhouse had been. By this time, the clubhouse had burned down and the point had been subdivided. After all the bloodshed, all the lynching beatings, marching, protesting, the Civil Rights Act was finally signed into law by President Lyndon Johnson in 1964. There was to be no more separate but equal. Blacks could go anywhere they wanted, eat in any restaurant, stay in any hotels. Although it was a great thing overall, it was like when the slaves were initially freed. There was no preparation for the black owned businesses to survive. They had been caught off guard thinking that segregation and their black customers would be there always. On a small chance that integration would happen, they thought that they would also have white customers. What's more, the highways were negatively shaping the black neighborhoods. Black communities and businesses were being systematically and historically erased. Woodland Park declined because now there were options and Black people wanted to test out their new freedom. The historical marker shown in the photograph is in front of the one-room schoolhouse. And it reads, Woodland Park, during the 1920s, investors Wilbur Lemon, A.E. Wright, Marion, and Ella Arthur, and others purchased land at Brookings, a former logging community. Here they platted Woodland Park as a summer resort for African Americans. These investors were also involved in developing the nearby resort Idlewild. Woodland Park, known for its quiet residential atmosphere, had a clubhouse for the property owners and lodging establishments, including the Royal Breeze Hotel. The Arthurs built the hotel around the original Brookings Lumber Company mill. Federal civil rights legislation passed during the 1960s gave African Americans equal access to public accommodations. This access allowed people to vacation where they please and lessen the need for resorts like Woodland Park. Woodland Park today is very different from the vision of Ella and Marion. It's multicultural community made up of descendant vacationers, new vacationers and residents and white families. As for the hotels and established businesses, they have either burned down, been abandoned or in hands of private families. Four of the five Dags cottages are still standing. They're in disrepair and overrode with vegetation. I took these pictures this summer once I found out where they were located. Odeers is still there, but again in disrepair. It's owned by a realtor who is gonna rehab it and make it into a boy's home. The repairs were just so extensive, she gave up the idea. So it sits there as a reminder of what once was there. I've been inside Odeers and there's still the piano there that he used to entertain his guests. The Calsonia is still there and it's owned by the Tyson family. Remember the young boy who worked for Frank Coombs? It's owned by his descendants. During the summer, they're there almost every weekend. I've also been in the Calsonia. I could imagine how comfortable the guests back then must have been. It has some renovations by the family. Now there are only eight bedrooms, but each has its own bathroom. A few years back, I was able to go into the one room schoolhouse. 
it has had some remodeling done with the goal of being the Woodland Park's historical museum. But it's a slow process with very little funding. I could just imagine how it was when both the black children of Woodland Park and the white children of Brookins Mill attended it. Sadly, the author's pride and joy, the Royal Breeze, burned down in the 1970s. The only remnants are the cement stairs that can be seen leading down to the lake and one of the old stone fireplaces. Thank goodness for Ella's postcards. Although the grandness of Woodland Park as a resort has waned, there are still many descendants still living and owning property in Woodland Park. Some four or five generations deep, mostly black. This photo is of me and my cousin Debbie. The picture on the right was taken about five or six years ago. I'm not gonna say how long ago the one on the left was taken. Um, we still have our family's original cottage that was built in 1947. And we try to make it there about four to six times a year. Woodland Park is in our every breath and in our hearts and will remain until both cease to go on. If you want to know more about Woodland Park, I've published a book, Woodland Echoes, A Cottage in My Heart, and I'm close to having a new one out shortly to commemorate Woodland Park's uh, centennial this year. Before opening this up to questions, I would love to recite one of the poems Ella wrote about Woodland Park. When you're tired of city's toil and strife, pack your grip, take your children and your wife, hop a train that's bound for the royal breeze, just the place the crowd agrees. Here you meet your friends from far and near, joy and laughter brighten days most drear. Not a chance to mope over moments sad. Come to Woodland Park and be made glad. Glad that life is coursing your veins. Glad you've found a place where God still reigns. Glad there's hope and faith among our race. Glad to meet your brother face to face. Ella Arthur. Thank you for your interest and participation today. And I will open this up to any questions you may have. Well, I hope everyone can join me in thanking Diana for such a lovely presentation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's, Thank you for having me. Um, and so either we did receive an audience question. If you have any more questions, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Um, and so I want to start with that. And then I do have, um, some of my own questions for you if we have time. Okay. And All so, right. um, uh, an attendee asked, is there an older map that shows the locations of the buildings around the lake? Um, no, there isn't. And that's on one of my to-do lists because I have been asked to do that over and over again. And like I said, I just found where the DAG's cottages were. So I'm going to work with one of the people that still knows where all those places are. I know where a lot of them are. So that's in the works. That's, that's great. Um, and I look forward to sort of seeing that when it happens. So just as you were sharing about your own family and the history of Woodland Park, I was curious how has your own understanding of the community changed um, since you sort of started the project and then now since you've finished the book and have been doing in continuing your research? Well, again, like I said, a lot of the, um, it, it isn't all black. Um, we have a lot of uh, white people that understand the beauty of the lake and, and the area, so it's, more mixed. Um, when I started the project, uh, I didn't know hardly anybody in Woodland Park except for my relatives. So, and we have, there's probably about six other cottages that are cross relatives. So, um, but when I started reaching out to other people, everybody had a story. So, um, 
it now when I go there, I know everybody. <laughs> so I don't know if that answered your question, but um, um, it, it's really a good place to go to. And I've made so many friends there. No, it did answer my question because I'm thinking about how fondly you're calling some of the relationships you've had been able to develop as well as thinking about how you learn, seem to be learning something new every time you go and every time things. <laughs> every time and the thing about Woodland Park is a lot of the residents that you know were some of the settlers they live long lives we have a lot of people in their 90s and some that have lived to be 100 or more so i say it's because of the magical waters and the <laughs> <laughs> sure. So I'm curious, was there anything that surprised you um, as you were doing research for this or talking to people and learning more about some of the founding families or some of just the race relations that were happening, considering that it seemed like it was in, in terms of a mixed community? Um, Everything surprised me because up until 2013, all I thought of Woodland Park was my favorite place to go to. And, you know, because I've been going there since I was a baby. And I never once questioned why it was there or why there were so many Black people in the woods. I, I never thought about it. And so um, the funny thing, too, is when I finally talked, made that connection with Malcolm X's nephew, he told me, you know, that it was a black resort built for, you know, during segregation. I never knew that. And when I told my father about it, my father said he never knew it either. So all we all we loved it for was the place that it was. So yes, everything was eye opening as the stories developed. Uh, we do have one more audience question. Um, mm -hmm. And somebody asked, um, how much did the African American populations of Idlewild and Woodland Park interact? Did they were there were they going to one another's businesses, um, churches, that sort of thing? Well, that one bishop that I told you was um, over the fourth district of the AME Church. His his name is on the Idlewild AME Church. Um, on the cornerstone because he's over that district. And yeah, they had uh, shuttle buses that would take them back and forth. So for the most part, uh, Woodland Park was very quiet. They didn't want to have entertainers. They didn't want that kind of, they, that wasn't the targeted um, group that they wanted. They wanted the people that were more social socialites, you know, the upper class when they first started. So that's what they wanted to attract. But the um, there would be people who wanted to go to Idlewild, of course, like uh, Joe Lewis, and they had shuttle buses that would take them back and forth. And some of the people who worked in Idlewild actually lived in Woodland Park. Oh, wow. That's helpful to sort of think about the way communities interacted with one another. Yes. Um, another question from the audience. Um, they recalled learning that Woodland Park Lake is a spring fed lake. Um, and that potentially is why it's so clear. Um, yes. Did you find any, could you speak a little bit more about that? Uh, I, I believe that's true because I live in Ohio and the lakes here are horrible. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ohio, <laughs> because they're river fed or tributary fed. And it, it's constantly um, churning up the, the bottom of the river. And so the lakes aren't very clear. But when you go around, I find a lot of the lakes in Michigan are very clear, but ours is really clear. If you're in the shallows, you see the bottom. Oh gosh, just thinking about going to a lake right now, it just, it's been so <laughs> pleasant and your background is so lovely considering the weather <laughs> that we currently have right now. Um, just real quick before I forget, we are about to drop a link into the chat for um, the survey, the, the event survey. You'll also be getting an email about that. I also just want to note, because we've 
received a few different questions about this. Mm -hmm. We are recording this presentation. Um, and my hope is that it will be up by tomorrow, but if not, it will be up by the beginning of next week at the very latest. Um, and so you can find that on our YouTube channel. It will also be emailed out um, and that sort of thing. And then one last question for you. Okay. Um, are people working to revitalize Woodland Park? So thinking about some of the buildings that are in disrepair and preserving that history? Actually, I, not really. The Calsonia, like I said, is in private hands and uh, they're there all the time. I would love to own that building. <laughs> the um, old deers, I went inside, as I said, um, there's so much work that needs to be done. There's, there's other places that um, are remnants of Woodland Park. And I don't think there's a big push to do anything with them. I, if I had the money, I would like to buy old deers and rehab it and make it like it was once before. Uh, the schoolhouse, I know that they, that's one place where they are working on it because as I said, they wanna make it into the Woodland Parks Historical Museum, but you know, that costs money. They, they did, they were the committee to get that historical marker. So at least they did get that done. Um, well, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. And if we want, if folks are interested in learning more in terms of where your work is taking you, um, is there a way for them to find out more or how um, can we do that? <laughs> That's a good question. Other than buying my book and <laughs> reading my book, <laughs> um, I am working with a publisher right now. So access to me may be a little easier. Um, I, I am on Facebook. <laughs> um, is your book, I, I, oh, I don't mean to cut you off, but I was just wondering, do you have a, a page up for about your book? I don't have that. I That's on my things to do later on. When you self-publish, you get like a year where they have a website for you, but it wasn't very interactive. So I just let them close it down when the year was up but I really need to do that. Um, I have received a lot of messages from people I don't know through Messenger once they found me on Facebook. And, and there was a, a lot of good surprises. One lady who uh, sent me a message about how much she loved my book, her cottage was like right down the road from mine. Oh my goodness. <laughs> she didn't know it. <laughs> Well, that's amazing. I just want to say thank you again, Diana, for joining okay. us this afternoon. It's been a pleasure listening to you talk so fondly about Woodland Park. I know I've learned a lot this afternoon. Um, and to our attendees, thank you. Um, and again, we did record this uh, and we will be posting it up on our YouTube channel. Thank you. Have a great thank afternoon, you. everyone.